Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final game of the World Chess Championship 2023. It's Yan Yipomnishi of Russia, it's Ding Liren of China, it's game 14. Out of a possible 14 games in the classical section, and whoever wins this game becomes the world champion, replacing Magnus Carlsen. Six and a half for both players. Ding Liren has white. I got nothing else to say. Buckle up. Here we go. Ding, throughout this match, has played either d4 or c4, and he has avoided main lines. Well, this game, and whoever has played white in this match has had the upper hand, except for one game. Ding does, in fact, play the move pawn to d4. Jan responds the same way he has responded now for two world championship matches. And after d4, knight f6, c4, e6, Ding plays knight c3. This is the second time in this match that he has played knight c3, allowing a Nimso Indian. The last time he played the Nimso was very, very wild line. Uh, this is also the third time in this match this specific move order was chosen. Uh, you'll remember that, that in, in uh, one of the early games, Jan played d4 and, uh, and then Ding played d5 on, on move three. So we have a Nimso, we have the move e3, we have castles, and in the last game that they played, where Ding played a Nimso Indian, which is one of the most complex openings in chess. In this position, he played the move a3, and sometime later, he played knight e2 knight here and played rook a2. And that was the day of the massive prep league. That was the day that it was discovered that two anonymous accounts had been training together on both major chess websites, and seemingly that was Ding's account. All right? Uh, well, this time, Ding still plays a sideline on move five, but not a bad move at all. He plays bishop d2. Now, the idea of bishop d2 is that you don't ever have to take the pawn, the knight with a pawn. You don't ever have to damage your pawns, and instead, you will always be able to do this, which in and of itself is an advantage. Black plays the move d5, a very principled response, and now Ding is like, excuse me, take my knight. And Jan is like, no, because that's why you put your bishop there, now I'm gonna go back, all right? Now, you may ask yourself, why would he move a piece two times? Why doesn't he go forward? Well, if you don't have a good reason, don't trade a bishop for a knight. In this case, black no longer has a good reason, because he's not damaging anybody's pawns. And black is able to afford playing these two moves, because white developed in a pretty weird way. The bishop on d2 now doesn't really fulfill its journey. Kind of like in the uh, House of the Dragon, right? You, you gotta, you know, the descendant is trying to go here and evolve. Well, this person is not going anywhere, so now the bishop is just sort of stuck. So, knight f3, and Jan plays c5. Uh, the best friend of the d-pawn is the c-pawn. And uh, as you can see, in queen's pawn positions, we have a cube. Very quickly, the cube uh, it gets completely obliterated. Pawn takes, bishop takes, and takes, takes. And knight bd7, and black will probably try to develop this bishop out this way. Uh, and uh, we have rook d1, centralizing the rook. Now, you'll notice that ding is down a lot on the clock. Uh, that's kind of weird. I don't know why he spent 13 minutes on this move. I think he's sort of just trying to improvise. I mean, it's still the opening and it's a relatively innocuous position. So don't really know why, again, like I, I, I am a little bit perplexed why that is happening, but uh, you know, such is life. Rook d1, and now Jan for the second time in this game goes bishop e7. So Jan has made 11 moves and four of them have been with his bishop. Bishop b4, bishop e7, bishop back out to c5, bishop e7, like a slinky, you know? Bang. Bow, bow. Wow, or is that a slingshot? All right, whatever, both, they're fun. Slinkies are the things you used to put on the stairs. I'm a 1995 kid, all right? That's what I did in my childhood. In and out of watching like Dragon Tales or whatever. Uh, knight g5 here is a very aggressive move. And in this position, Ding decides, I don't wanna go you know, quietly into that good knight. <clears throat> and instead I'm gonna play the move knight to g5 and I, I wanna checkmate my opponent because that decides the game. Now, probably he's not gonna play queen h7. Some of you might play that move. He won't play that move. But the real question about knight g5 is, what the heck are you going to do about the move h6? Like, I've just done a few chess lessons with Frank. If you don't know who Frank is, uh, learn who Frank is. He's a rapidly uh, growing chess prodigy. And I've, I told Frank to stop making these random knight moves when they can be attacked. Well, 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 well Ding plays h4. Ding plays what is known as a fish hook. Fish bait, whatever you want to call it, fishing pole. Point is, black has castled, white hasn't, and if you take this, you lose. I mean, you just lose. You, you, you don't move your knight and get mated in one move. 
but the pressure here is too strong on, on, on the file. It's actually a very, very useful idea. Knight g5, h6. Uh, for beginners and intermediates, I mean, this is basically like game over. I mean, once you play h4, the other person will just malfunction. But Jan is 27.95. Um, and uh, he plays the move queen c7. Now, of course, he did spend some time. Queen c7 actually is the best response. Basically ignoring this like a crazy person on a New York City subway. Uh, and queen here hits the bishop. And basically just continues to develop and ask questions to white's position. Now, Ding here spends a little bit of time. And by a little bit of time, I mean 22 minutes. Uh, and he, it's not that he spent 22 minutes uh, realizing his bishop was hanging. The bishop move has massive consequences. And by going to e2, I mean, he's basically completely taking his eye off this pawn. Because you understand, he could have also went to b3, but probably he did not like something over here. And I mean, he can sacrifice his right to castle, but uh, black has to trade a few pieces. And then at some point, he will be able to take this knight. So bishop e2, and uh, Jan is much better. He's up 40 minutes on the clock with black. This is nuts. I mean, Ding was supposed to be the one playing for a win. Not supposed to, but he's white. All right, he's playing with the white pieces. White has had massive success in this match. And it seems like the pressure is simply getting to him. Now, here the best move was b6, apparently. Uh, and then uh, you're trying to get the bishop out. And if something like rook c1, the best move is queen b8. I feel like if you play b6, queen b8, they, they, gotta, they gotta scan you or something. I don't even understand this stuff. Jan plays rook d8, bringing a rook to the, to the center of the board. Absolutely nothing wrong with this move. And now rook c1, and now knight f8. All right, knight f8, you know what they say. Knight f8, never mate. Nobody's ever getting mated on the h7 square. And by the way, now taking on g5 could very well be a threat. For instance, before, uh, take, take, uh, you have backup, so you can move the other knight. So we have knight e4, knight takes e4, knight e4, and a trade. And th there looks to be an end in sight. All right, this setup did not work by Ding. And we're headed for a draw. And if this game ends in a draw, it's going to be 7-7. And then we're going to take a break. And tomorrow we are going to play tie breaks. And a classical world championship match will be decided by speed chess. Just like everybody wanted. Um, I am joking, but at the same time, you do need a way to break a tie. In 19, I believe it was 84, Karpov Kasparov went three months. I don't think we want a match that goes three months. I mean, I would make tremendous ad revenue on it, but um, yeah, that match was first to six wins, and nobody won six games. It was deleted, basically. <laughs> the match was interrupted. So the, somebody has to break the tie, and it looks like that's where we're headed. Bishop d7. Why am I saying that? Well, the eval says it, so that must be true. Uh, they have two rooks. They have knight, bishop, bishop. They have the exact same material. They have the exact same pawns, a, b, e, f, g, h. They, I mean, it's going to, you know... And then here, something weird happens. Ding plays bishop b4. Now, there is nothing really weird about that move. It's just the bishop trade. But he's damaging his own pawns. I mean, he did not have to do that. He could have played bishop c3, and bishop c6, and bishop f3, and I don't know, knight here, rook c1, brought it, but... Clearly, Ding was disturbed by the fact that he thinks black is probably getting active too quickly. Knight g6, knight g6, not knight g5. So he goes here, and Jan grimaced when he saw this move. He sat down and was like, what? Take, take, and bishop c6, and Jan is better. Jan is better, and he's up 27 minutes. This is really bad. This is really, really bad. And it gets worse. It gets worse. Knight c5, played by Ding Li Ren in this position, sacrificing a pawn. Just giving it up completely. Could he have done anything else? He could have played passively. Could have went here. Knight g6, he could have tried to get this kind of an endgame. Now, knight e5 attacks the pawn. King e2. Instead, Ding is just unraveling. I mean, he's sacrificing a pawn in an otherwise balanced endgame-ish position. This is wild. Rook to g1, and in this position... Jan needs to choose between these two moves. It's more accurate to go here. Why? Because after the move b5, he comes back. And after the move e4, he doesn't move his bishop anywhere. He plays b6. A very important Zwitschenzug. You take the bishop. They take, take. And it's actually black who emerges up a pawn with white having three massive pawn islands. 
You can count this as a double island if you want. Knight e6 is coming and black is playing for a win. You put Magnus here with black, he wins 99 games out of 100. And that 100 game, I don't know, he fell asleep at the board. I mean, this is a very, very bad endgame. So Jan has to find the right retreat of his bishop. He has to go bishop c6, inducing b5, and then this. Jan doesn't. In fact, look at how much time Jan spent. 58 minutes on the clock. He doesn't notice the subtle difference. And the difference with this move order is after e4, ain't nobody going b6. Because this pawn is not on b5. So after take, take, I don't have a pawn here. I can just do this. That's, that's, there's a massive difference. But he has an hour on the clock. The nerves are in the stratosphere. What's beyond that? I don't even know. Some, some, something. I just make chess videos. Any of you study the layers of the atom? I had to learn that in school. Then I forgot just like everything else. Bishop c6 though. Now there is no b6. This trick does not work. And Jan's bishop is booted out of the position. Now, Jan is still doing fine. Uh, and Ding collects the pawn. He gave the pawn. He gets it back. Uh, and now Jan does something absolutely fascinating. So, in this position, black can play rook d7 attacking the knight. But, Jan plays this, inducing the move rook c4, offering a trade and simultaneously defending the pawn. And then he goes here. What the heck is the difference? This is how chess grandmasters think. This position is the right way to do this. Why? Because if you do this with the white rook two squares back, then after the move knight to c5 and rook to c7, there is a pin and the rook is way, way further back, right? So the rook for white is way further back, but the knight can still be supported, okay? That's number one. But the, the craziest detail here is the fact that if the knight goes out this way, black will mobilize and come here. That's the threat. And there is rook g4 protecting that. However, if black plays the move rook d4 first, then after this, this, nobody can go here because knight g6, rook g4, there is a fork. By inducing white to play the rook forward, you have now removed the option to bring the rook to g4. This is some, this is some giga brain stuff, all right? That is why Jan played rook to d4 first so that his opponent plays a rook move, and then he attacks the knight, and now the knight can go here. So in this position, Ding plays this instead. Incredible, all right? Rook c7. Ding drops back with the rook, and now he's enabled the movement of his knight. And now disaster strikes. Rook c8 played by Yan. Ding defends his knight. In this position, Ding had a miracle defensive move, by the way. He could have put the knight back on b7. He could have gotten out of danger by using the fact that that rook is hanging against Jan. And then after rook c3, bc3, white goes king d2 and suddenly is going to quickly win that pawn back. He doesn't see that. He plays here, knight d7. Oh god. Dingley Ren is at his biggest disadvantage of the game so far. Rook to g3. What Ding had to do in this position was bring his king, trade the pieces, and play rook b1 and defend his pawn. And he's down a pawn, but he's got activity and he's kind of okay. Will he hold this? I don't know. Instead, Ding goes for g7. Jan can play it cool here. He could just play g6. He doesn't even need to allow rook g7. But instead, Jan plays this. Take, take. Ding's idea is to get this, but the black king is just walking to e7. This is a massive, massive oversight. Bishop d3 played by Ding. Not a bad move. Rook d8 
And now, Ding has a choice. How can he defend this? He's got to probably do it with the king, okay? Now, king d2 is a little bit terrifying because you're walking into a pin. So, obviously, Ding, as a human, is like, I'm not going to do that. I'm probably going to go king e2 instead. And just so you understand, defending like this is probably also possible. But Ding plays king e2 and essentially loses the game. Stockfish doesn't even realize because it's on a low depth. But after the move rook c3, black is winning. Black is winning. Why is black winning in this position? Because of the threat of taking the bishop. For example, if the rook comes back, black wins. Rook d3 takes bishop b5. Game over. You can defend the rook, but I'm going to go take, 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 take. This is a winning endgame. Three pawns, four pawns. My king runs over here. You go win this pawn. I win the rest of the pawns. Not only do I win the game, I win the world championship. This is nuts. Rook c3 and Yan Yipomnishi is winning. If we let Stockfish run a little bit more, you're going to see it's like minus three. The game is over. So check king e7 and Ding plays here. The game is over. Yan's got to play rook b3. He cannot rush with this. If he rushes with that, I do this. This is not winning. We have the same amount of pawns. Rook b3 is the winning idea. Rook b4, rook b2, a lot of pressure. Bishop b5. Jan's advantage here is minus three, according to some of the most powerful computers. The computer will realize it. And the idea is essentially rook h8, rook d4, white can't move a piece. White is going to have to give up the pawn on b5 completely, and white is probably going to lose. This is nuts. This is absolutely nuts. It's over. 21 minutes on the clock. And in this position, Yan Yipomishi delivers the most fatal blow of the World Championship match. And he plays... He played e5. He played pawn to e5. He did not play rook b3 and rook d4. He didn't play any of that. He went e5. And all of a sudden, Ding Li Ren counters with b6! Uh, this is incredible. b6 is a clearance sacrifice. It's a sacrifice where you utilize the square a piece used to stand on for a tactic. And the idea of the move pawn to b6, mind you, that is the only defensive resource left in this position. Pawn to b6, giving up the pawn to sacrifice the rook, rook e8, and discovered check with the bishop on the square that you just cleared. You give it up, rook c3, buckle down, Let's go. Rook and three pawns, all symmetrical, EFH, versus rook and four, that's the only pawn. Black is still pushing for a win, but Ding thinks he can hold this position. Can he, though? Can he hold this position, or is Jan going to convert this? King d7. White's defensive idea. Black, what does black want? Push the pawn, put the rook behind the pawn, push the pawn, white's rook gets stuck here. That, that, that's winning, okay? So for example, a5, if you wait too long, look what happens. Black is completely winning. Why is black completely winning? Because this rook is, is hydraulic pressing, this rook, if you will. And if white walks over to win this pawn, like say, let's say king c4, look, king b4, oh, wow, you won this pawn, yay! Now they feast. So that's essentially the winning idea. What is Ding gonna do? With the king coming, he's going to play rook f3. He's going to bother the pawn on f7. Black is going to have to defend the pawn, okay? And now white is going to play rook c3, trying to infiltrate. And he does. King f6, rook c6, the king hides from checks. Now rook here. So defending the pawn from the back side, not allowing black to hydraulic press. So black comes down and also defends the pawn from the opposite side. But this is not an advantage. Now... Next phase of the game, black is going to try to bring the king over here, get rid of the rook, promote the pawn. Okay, here we go. King g3, pawn to h5, moving the pawn out of the way, and Jan is pushing the pawn forward, closer and closer. Look at Ding's time. 22 minutes spent on one king move. 
All right, rook a5, f6. That pawn is now two squares away from queening. Of course, Stockfish thinks this is a draw. Of course, it's easy to sit here and stare at it and go, oh, uh, duh. Let me turn this off real quick. You're all so clever. I'm so clever. Every commentator is so clever. It's just a draw. So defend the position. Rook a6, king f7. Black is bringing the king. And let it be known, you might be confused. Why was this not taken? Because rook e1, pawn to a2, you could take my rook, I make a queen. You could stop my pawn, I'm still making the queen. This is winning, all right? This is probably winning. <laughs> probably winning. <laughs> Why did I say the word probably? This is completely winning. Sometimes my mouth moves faster than my brain, all right? King e2, king e7, rook a1, king f7, rook a2. Why did I pause here? Look at Ding's time. Five minutes up to 19. Why? Move 60. This is it. This is the final phase of the final game of the World Chess Championship 2014. Can Yan Nipomnishi win this endgame? Now Ding gets 30 seconds every time he makes a move, but he gets no more bonus time. King F3, there he goes. King d7, he's making a run for it. A calculated pawn sacrifice to deflect the rook. Rook a6, now rook b3. White's king is forced back. King c7. Yan Nipomnishi is on the verge of winning this endgame. Ding Liren has one move and one move only. What am I talking about? Well, if Ding hangs out on the a-file, king b7, rook here, I'm coming. King c6. You can, uh, well, all right, so what? King b5, so what? The black king is gonna walk right here and escort the pawn. Okay, well, well, uh, fine. I mean, I, I'll just bring my king, king f1, and I'll, I'll run over. Yep. All right, let's say you do that, king c6. All right, I'm bringing my king too. You're too slow. You don't understand. You could bring your king. Congrats. Who's gonna guard the pawns? Oh, that's easy. Who's gonna guard the pawns? The king is still coming in. White is on the verge of being completely lost. And Ding Li Ren plays the most clutch move of his entire chess career. F4! Completely and totally sacrificing a pawn in order to create a pass pawn of his own. Just the existence of his pawn now threatens everything in the black position because black does not have the luxury anymore of running the king forward. He still tries. King c6. Check is given. King to b5, rook to a7. Now, in this position, if Jan makes a run for it, so does white. If he plays rook e3, e7, king to b3. Oh, wait, the black king made it. But the black king now has to hide in front of his own pawn. That's the point. And this is a draw. Ding Li Ren foresaw this position. And if king a1, white has the miracle defense, rook b3. Sacrificing the rook to promote the pawn, and this, my friends, is just a draw. All the pawns will fall. Ding Li Ren sacrifices his F pawn to create a pass pawn of his own, not to push it, but to constantly threaten, like a lifted hand, the hand of, of fury. Like, if you mess with me, I'm coming down with this pawn. And Jan tries to move forward. He tries many, many different ways. Can he find a way? King e7 back. Rook e3, it doesn't matter. Ding Li Ren has found the defensive mechanism to, pro to, to save this game. Because now there is an orb around the black king. It makes no difference. Because king g2, king can't go anywhere. There it is. The pawns are traded. Rook takes f4. And in this position, game 14 was agreed to a draw, a 90 move, six and a half hour affair, nothing to choose between them, seven for Yan Pomnishi, seven for Ding Li Ren, and tomorrow we play tie breaks to determine the next world chess champion. How do the tie breaks work? They play four games of 25 minute chess, a best of four. If that is tied two to two, they play five plus three second blitz. If that's a tie, that goes on a second time. And if that's a tie, they play three plus two, just like on chess.com until there is a winner. There is no Armageddon. There is no Armageddon. They play a blitz game 
until the end. I will see you all tomorrow when we will crown a new world champion of chess. Now get out of here.